All right, hi everyone. So welcome to track one. I uh, hope you're not too tired today because uh, we're going to talk about the React fatigue. Um, and also I'm going to explain to you how we can embrace this so-called React fatigue. Uh, before we get started, I want to ask you all, uh, has anyone heard about this game? Yeah. Okay, that's pretty cool, one. So I'll show you a video. Uh, this is actually uh, called the NPM drinking game. Uh, the rules are very simple. You search for an English word in NPM, and if it exists, uh, you drink. Um, actually, Sarviar has created a, a CLI for it. She also created a front end for it. So let's give it a try. Uh, as you can see, OK, if we type React, we know it exists. You drink. Uh, Atom, Atom.js, this exists. OK, there's something called Atom. Uh, Plain.js, hmm, OK, this exists. Paris, ah, something called Paris, OK. Uh, what else? Phone.js, we have it. So you still drink at that point. That's already a few drinks. Um, what else? Time, OK, this time .h bindings for Node.js. Glass.js, it exists as well. Yeah, so that's starting to be quite a lot. What else going to have? Window.js, uh, expose the window objects uh, and JSON. So yeah, at that point, okay, maybe server. Okay, so there's a server called server uh, in Node. Um, at that point, express, okay, we know it exists, but this is already quite a lot of drinks. Uh, are fast, okay, well, that's really getting to a lot of drinks. Uh, in Western Europe, I mean, we cannot handle that much. Uh, I don't know about Slavic countries, but this is already too much. Uh, even if you can handle it, I would seriously advise uh, against playing that game. It sounds fun like uh, when you trade like that, but actually, uh, this is the number one reason why uh, we cannot find JS developers nowadays, because all the JavaScript developers that try this NPM drinking game, uh, they failed, and now we cannot find developers. Uh, but don't worry, this is actually a good thing. It, um, the loss was not for nothing. Uh, it actually showcased what's called the JS fatigue. And JS fatigue is something um, that, it's a term that emerged a few years ago. Uh, it's the fact that our ecosystem is crazy in the JavaScript world. So as we know, this is the ECMAScript spec uh, that's, that has new features every year. Uh, you have new libraries, new frameworks, new techniques, uh, new so-called good practices. Uh, it gets really, really easy for people in our community uh, to suffer from imposter syndrome. Uh, also, not only do you have JavaScript itself, but now you have to also learn uh, supersets of JavaScript. So uh, TypeScript, maybe Flow. Also, if you want to do backend, uh, you need to know Node.js. If you do not want to do backend work, you still need to know uh, Node.js to be able to launch uh, your front end or to work with front end tooling. And by the way, speaking of front-end, uh, the tooling complexity is crazy. Uh, now we have Webpack, we have Babel, uh, because we need to ship optimized code, bundle, uh, transpy for all the clients. It really makes the entry barrier uh, really complicated. Uh, so let's have a look how this all looks. Uh, so as we can see, it all starts with JavaScript, right? So we need to know JavaScript. Uh, then after that, Node.js if you want to do back-end work, but not only. And if you want to do front-end, again, so you have to transpile. Uh, speaking of front-end, or even in the back-end, you'll probably have uh, to shape some optimized bundle, uh, maybe some static files, whatever you want to do with your build, you'll need Webpack or similar. Uh, you'll need to know about NPM to work with uh, packages in the JavaScript world. Um, most likely, you'll need to work with types. So you'll work with either uh, TypeScript, or maybe, uh, if you prefer Flow, you'll work with Flow. Uh, by the way, that's not the only option. Uh, maybe you don't even like JavaScript, you think it's not a good language for any reason, and you want to work with something else. So in that case, you can use Reason. Uh, or maybe you're one of these uh, people that were working with JavaScript before ES6, and in that case, you were probably using CoffeeScript, and you still have it in your code base. Uh, it was really popular before ES6. Or maybe you like closures, so you work with closure scripts. So at that point, you're like, okay, well, that's already quite a lot, but it's going to be worse, actually, in the years to come, because now we have WebAssembly. So with WebAssembly, what that means is that you will have um, literally, potentially, any language that will be able to be compiled down or targeted uh, to the WebAssembly VM um, into bytecode, right? Meaning, 
uh, that you can use, uh, for instance, C++, you can use Rust, which are both uh, very, very good targets. Uh, you can use C Sharp also with WebAssembly. By the way, if you use C Sharp, probably using something called Blazor, which is a sort of full stack framework uh, for C Sharp that allows you to write both uh, server code and also um, client side SPA code. If you use Rust, there is something uh, React like called U as well, which, is, which you probably use. So as you can see, that world is crazy, and it's going to be crazier and crazier because of WebAssembly, because of all the tooling that keeps on evolving. But we're not here to talk about the JavaScript fatigue here, right? Uh, my, my talk is called actually React fatigue. Mm. So React fatigue, um, probably you haven't heard about that term, and it's absolutely normal. Uh, I found one occurrence of it, uh, and that was in an article by Sasha Griff called A Study Plan to Cure JavaScript Fatigue. And this guy actually asked, can you cure React fatigue? And I think that's a very good question because we do not speak uh, about the actual fatigue in our specific community. We just talk about it in the JavaScript world in general. Uh, so why do I think we have fatigue in React? Um, well, I have a high-level theory for that, uh, very personal. I think uh, in our community, uh, we have way more influ uh, influential voices. So on the one hand, you have Ryan Dahl, uh, creator of Node.js, a uh, very smart guy, uh, very good at what he does. But if you, if you take uh, things um, this way, no, it's, it's not very uh, that influential if you compare it to Dan Abramov. So Dan Abramov is this guy that, of course, everyone will always follow. In the community, there's really a sort of persona cult you know, around him. Uh, but if you want to get more technical, I think that uh, the reason why we have fatigue uh, is that we have in the React uh, community a new paradigm. So when React was um, launched, it was bringing some uh, novelty, right? It was bringing this idea of modularity, of thinking of your UI as a function of state. Uh, and before, we were really doing everything with a framework. So we had, for instance, Angular on the front end. Uh, we did things with Angular. We, know we didn't think about uh, routing. We didn't have to think about state management, all these things. I mean, we, we could uh, short circuit it and uh, find alternative libraries for it. Uh, but most likely, we wouldn't. I mean, everything was really uh, done by the framework itself. And uh, you really needed to work around it if you wanted to not work with their features. Uh, meaning that now we have this uh, micro framework or library actually, uh, and we have new problems to solve right in this community. Uh, we have very fast iterations. We're always trying to find the best ways uh, to do things, the best library to do stuff, the best patterns, uh, and also we have access to the npm ecosystem. Uh, so sure, you had it with Angular or any framework before, but did you really need it much? I mean. Again, everything was done by the framework, so it didn't uh, need much of libraries. So let's have a look, actually, how React Fatigue looks like, uh, as opposed to JavaScript Fatigue. So same thing, we start with JS, right? Or maybe TypeScript, if that's your thing. Uh, Flow, if that's your thing, it's, that's fine. And then, of course, we have React at the core of it. Uh, at some point, you'll probably need to do uh, state management. So you'll use library like Redux, or maybe you think it's Mobix, that's fine. Uh, by the way, if you use Redux, you have to use, uh, you have to know the Flux model, or maybe you don't like uh, Redux as an opinionation of Flux, and you'll just use Flux.js. Uh, you have to do routing as well, so probably you'll use React Router or any other solution. Uh, if you like GraphQL, by the way, you'll probably have to use uh, Apollo Client, uh, or maybe something like URQL, Relay, whatever, but you, you'll still need a client uh, to do things in a uh, nice declarative way. Or if you prefer uh, to do everything with Redux and you have HTTP, HTTP calls, maybe you'll wrap them in a Redux Saga for side effects. Uh, also, it's not only about React, there's also Reason. So everything that I said here also applies to Reason, uh, which in the case of Reason, you work with uh, Reason React, but there's also still an ecosystem around it. By the way, there's also styling, uh, so you have to work uh, probably with CSS and JS, with style components, emotion, or any kind of uh, similar tool. And so as we've seen, uh, React is this very uh, bare-bone thing, uh, which is not batteries included. It's really just this view library, and that's it. Um, but then you can build framework uh, around it, right? Uh, so for instance, you have uh, Next.js. Uh, so Next.js, 
is a framework uh, for React. Um, Gatsby also is a framework for React, and they both share uh, that same idea that uh, they will have front-end abstractions uh, and also some opinionation of React. Uh, so for instance, in the case of Gatsby, there'll be uh, data fetching done in a certain way, abstracted for you. Uh, routing will be abstracted in a certain way for you. Uh, same thing with Next.js, there'll be server-side rendering. Uh, there'll be routing done in a certain way, caching, uh, many things that uh, are already thought about. So you don't have to, to think of the whole uh, React ecosystem and what to choose. Also, there is a Relay, uh, which I've chosen to put here in a React Frameworks list. Uh, why is that? Well, because it's sort of architecture your app in a way. Uh, so it's not a React uh, opinionation per se, in the sense that it doesn't tell you, okay, you need to use this package, this package. It, it's not batteries included like Next or Gatsby. Um, but still, I mean, it will make your architecture your app in a way. So you have query component collocation for GraphQL in a certain way. You have directives. You have many things that will make you have to work uh, the relay way. Also, uh, there is this thing called full-stack frameworks, or the rails for the JavaScript world. Mm. So let's see uh, what the Vulkan uh, creator, which is actually Sasha Grief, um, the guy that made the State of JS survey, um, says about Vulkan. So he says Vulkan is unique in that it spans uh, the full-stack from database to browser, while there are many excellent backend framework or backend as a service providers, they still require you to handle front end code yourself, including building a set of components to read, write, and display data. Because Vulkan is full stack, it's, it's able to speed up this repetitive task by providing a whole range of helper components. What does that mean is that uh, this is basically the rails of React, right? So it will uh, have abstractions that span across the whole stack, and with these abstractions, you'll be able to do things faster. Um, so as we can see, there's like really this idea of building on top of no batteries included. So you, st you start with React, uh, which is literally just this simple view library, and you layer on top of it maybe front-end framework, maybe full-stack framework. Um, but it's all a decision. It's, uh, it's all opt-in as opposed to Rails. Uh, so as we can see, um, there's Meteor also, which is the same as Vulkan. Uh, same thing is uh, full stack framework, all batteries included. And Vulkan, uh, which is more uh, GraphQL oriented uh, using Apollo. So that's a little uh, review of the uh, ecosystem around React. And uh, before we start with an actual uh, story on the React fatigue, I think it's time to introduce myself. So, uh, my name is Alexandre Gomez. I'm a front end developer, full stack, uh, depending on how you view it, uh, focusing on the front end logic. Uh, these days, I've worked also on the back end previously. And yeah, if you have any questions about the React Fatigue, uh, just ask them later on or uh, when it's time for questions. So, uh, how did I experience React Fatigue? Well, to know about that, we have to know about my experience with web development. Uh, so again, I'm a full stack developer, uh, started on the back end, actually. Uh, I worked for one year uh, in some IoT company in Node.js. My first job, I learned a lot about nodes, I learned a lot about JavaScript internals, that was great. Um, and I really loved JavaScript at that point, and I was also trying React uh, in pet project. And at some point, a company, so, um, a few companies started actually to contact me. I've decided to go with one that had interesting front-end project. Uh, and they were like, don't worry, you don't need any CSS. Just work on client-side logic. So I mean, I was really fine with that. Uh, and it was actually a really, really complex uh, front-end project. Uh, really, really a lot of abstractions, many libraries uh, to learn, many patterns to know that I had no clue about at the time. And again, I had zero front-end experience, so I straight up uh, took this very complex project. Uh, and so what I mean by, uh, when I say complex project is that actually uh, complex apps in React, they will need patterns. So there's often this idea that, oh, React is just JS, you know, you can get started with React uh, in one day, just learn the API, it's simple, uh, it's just a few lifecycle hooks, it's fine, right, it's easy. And actually, no, React is not that easy. So the entry barrier, I mean, is very uh, low. You can get started with React today even if you don't know anything about React. But if you want to master it, I mean, 
it's going to be uh, really complex because there's this crazy ecosystem. And if you take uh, Angular as an example, uh, it's totally the opposite, actually. Uh, because with Angular, you have uh, something that's very hard to learn, a lot of abstractions. But once you know it, you know it. And you can work with it, and you'll be fine. Um, so to see why I've chosen React, uh, I'll tell you about some uh, pet project I was working in. Uh, and I'm saying pet project because that's actually a doggo. So uh, I wanted to put doggos on the blockchain. Yeah, it was kittens at the time, and the guy made uh, millions with that. So I was like, okay, maybe if I put doggos on the blockchain, it will be also really good. Uh, so I've chosen React to do that project, by the way. And why did I choose React? Because I like liberty, right? I like my freedom. And I was like, okay, that's perfect. Uh, I'm lazy, right? So I don't have to learn anything. Uh, I just simple API. Uh, I don't have to learn any uh, domain-specific language, like in Angular, which is perfect, uh, because, again, I'm lazy. I'm a developer. Um, no opinionation, so same thing, freedom. You know, I was really happy. And obviously, React was uh, the de facto choice for me at the time. I mean, I didn't think of it twice. Uh, it just was uh, so logical for me to use it. Also, OK, it had a few advantages. So UI is a function of state, unidirectional data flow, functional style. Yeah, but mostly, I wanted my freedom. And yes, yeah, so as I've said, I'm lazy. And uh, with React, it's a library. It's not a framework. So React is just JS, uh, meaning that you have no concepts to learn on top of JavaScript uh, or the DOM, right? You just have a simple API. You just have to think of your um, app in a component way as a function of state, and that's it. You know React, right? Uh, in fact, if you look at this uh, on the React web page, uh, the example, you'll see that if you disable JSX, I mean, this is uh, totally valid JavaScript, right? Uh, you, you pass that with anything, that'll be valid. I mean, sure, if you use JavaScript, uh, JSX, they'll be non-standard, um, but this is valid. But the thing is that with React, very quickly, you realize that React, ah, you need a bit more than just knowing React. Uh, and very quickly, you'll probably uh, have to learn about Redux. Or actually, it's, um, for most people, they learn about Redux the same way they learn of uh, React, because that's how it's presented to them. It just goes hand in hand together. Uh, can you raise your hand if you actually learned uh, React and Redux together? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so that, that's, that's really the way it's presented to everyone. I mean, Redux is like the de facto choice for, for React at that point. And why should it be, you know? I mean, uh, if you think of it, it should really uh, be batteries none included with React. And yet, uh, this, this pattern that we, we present as everyone as the de facto choice. And not only do you have Redux, by the way, but very quickly you realize that the side effects model uh, in Redux is not optimal, right? So you try to do side effects in Redux, and you realize that, OK, uh, this is not optimal. So maybe you'll try to use something like Redux Saga, to create sagas. Uh, so OK, with Redux Sagas, uh, you'll have the problem uh, ported somewhere else. Um, you can do your API call or whatever side effect you're doing. Um, and you can do it uh, with sagas and in a very declarative way. Uh, by the way, this presents also uh, two new things to learn. Uh, so first thing you need to learn about uh, sagas, meaning that you also have to learn Redux. And not only that, but you have to learn about generators. Uh, many people in the JavaScript world actually don't know about generators, so that's one more thing to learn here. And I think sagas anyway is not a very good thing, uh, because it's just moving the problem away, right? Uh, so with sagas, I mean, you still have boilerplate, different kind of boilerplate, but still boilerplate. Um, and you're still abstracting uh, your API calls, or in my case, uh, blockchain calls, um, to Redux. You know, so you, you're still uh, having this side effects model uh, where you're abstracting things in a way it shouldn't be, in my opinion. And surely there must be a better alternative to that, right? Uh, and there is one. We'll see it very soon. Uh, but before, I want to tell you about the Redux ecosystem. Uh, so Redux ecosystem is really huge. Uh, one, you have the actual uh, flux pattern that you need to, know, to learn, you know, if you want to know about Redux. Uh, so that's underlying concept. You have to know that. Uh, then you have Redux itself, the model. Uh, then you have the React Redux API. 
um, that you have to learn about. Uh, then you have Redux sagas, maybe, if you want to do sagas. Um, then you have tongues, uh, if you want to use tongues, Redux tongue, there'll be. Uh, and again, that's made by Dan Abramov, so it's very popular. Uh, then you have reselect, selectors, li uh, um, selectors library uh, to be able to create memo selectors. Uh, and you have things like Redux Promise, Redux Form, React Redux Form to create forms, uh, Redux Watch to create watch. I mean, the ecosystem is just huge. Like, I could go for hours with that. Uh, there's actually a web page on the Redux website stating all um, the ecosystem of Redux. And believe me, it's huge. So that's a lot to learn. That's a lot to learn. And that's a lot of choices that you have to decide to make or not to make. Uh, but one thing I really like, though, uh, with Redux is that uh, it taught me about HOCs. Uh, so first time I used Connect, uh, I didn't learn anything about uh, functional programming or higher order functions. Uh, so I had this weird function uh, with uh, this signature map state to props, map dispatch to props. I was like, what does that mean? Uh, then I read a bit about it, and I, can s I see that it actually injects the, the state, uh, inject the dispatch with that function. Um, and this is called a higher order function, right? Uh, so it will inject uh, some function um, with the return of the previous function as arguments. Uh, so this is functional pattern. And in fact, uh, that answers to one problem we have in React, and that's uh, how to actually compose components, right? Uh, same problem as functional programming. How do you compose functions? Here's like how to comp compose components. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, your components are basically functions. So I wanted to do component uh, composition, and I started uh, digging into HOCs. And I started doing uh, stuff like that. Um, not very clean, actually. So as you can see, we start uh, with the user card. That's the component we want to inject with stuff. And then we have three components. Uh, we have connect, uh, which is Redux connect, basically. Uh, then we have with state, uh, which is uh, coming from Recompose uh, HOC library, uh, which was a very popular way to inject stateless component with state at the time. So you can see you have your state field, initial state, um, and uh, sorry, uh, state field, setter, and initial state. Uh, also, I had this which translation that I built, uh, which is uh, HOC that would inject with I18N, uh, some translations uh, given a namespace. But as you can see, I mean, this is already quite ugly. So maybe you think that something like that would be better for composition. Uh, so first, you have your user card with translation, which is user card uh, injected with translation. Uh, then you have your user card with translation and state, uh, which same thing as before, uh, we take the injected user card with translation and injected uh, the state. And then uh, we injected connect and pick state. Don't ask me why I'm doing that. This is just for the example. Uh, and it's, it's actually an anti-pattern that people often do. So. And at that point, uh, I found about Compose. So Compose, uh, you'll find it under different names. Uh, if you go into Redux, uh, it's there as Compose. Uh, if you use Lodash, it's called FlowWrite, uh, because you have your data flowing uh, left to right, actually. Uh, if you use Lodash FP, which is Lodash with different names, uh, then uh, it will also be called Compose. That's the usual functional programming name for it. And as you can see, uh, this is way more semantic to read. And at this point, I thought I was um, done with learning a lot of stuff. Uh, but people started telling me, OK, man, rest is dead. So you should learn about this thing called GraphQL. And I was like, mm, what's GraphQL? I never heard of that. So I started making my research. Um, I was a bit skeptical at first, but I ended up really liking it. And actually, it was a perfect choice uh, for my crypto doggos. Uh, you'll see why in a second. Uh, so the first thing with GraphQL is that it's very declarative. So if you're a front-end developer, I mean, the data fetching is done in such a declarative way, it feels amazing to use, as opposed to, let's say, a REST APIs. Uh, it's composed of two things, a query language and a SDL, schema definition language, uh, plus then resolvers to be able to resolve uh, that query uh, against the schema. And it allows you also to ask only for what you need, meaning that uh, you'll never overfetch. You ask the server for what you need, you get what you need, that's it. Nothing more, nothing less. Um, also, it doesn't define how you get your data. 
So it can literally be the resolvers uh, how you want. For instance, uh, Gatsby does it with uh, static files, actually. Uh, so with Gatsby, you can uh, query your static file system. It will work. Uh, also, the good thing with GraphQL is that it doesn't have to be a server. So it's often presented as a server. Um, but the thing with GraphQL is that actually, again, it's just query, schema, resolvers. If you have that, you can put that in your client. It works very well. Uh, in certain use cases, it's even better, actually, than having a server. And yeah, GraphQL, by the way, is just a spec. Uh, so it was created by Facebook. And at some point, they decided to open source it. And they didn't uh, open source it uh, as a library. No, they open sourced it as a spec, meaning that uh, there is the official GraphQL JS. Uh, but then there's also Apollo, there's also Yercule, there's also a lot of libraries built on top of it. And then it's uh, all for the community to build second layers, third layers on top of it. So as we've seen, uh, GraphQL doesn't define how, which for me was perfect for the blockchain because I wanted to get data from it. Uh, so I wanted to get a block at a certain number. Uh, for this block, I wanted to know the hash. I wanted to have the list of transactions uh, with certain filter pass as arguments. Uh, I wanted to have the index, the hash, um, the from that address, and to that address. So I could have that this way, and I could request it like that. Uh, by the way, that's from ETHQL, which is uh, some wrapper for Ethereum on GraphQL, uh, which is a very popular pattern uh, to build wrappers around whatever in GraphQL. And again, this doesn't define how you get data. So if you look, uh, this is from the ETHQL code base, actually, in GitHub. Uh, you can have a look yourself. That's from there. Um, so that's some extract. You can see that the export default, we export a block object. And this block has different functions. So it has minor, parent, and transaction. So all of this, it's fields that we can query with GraphQL. And for instance, if you take uh, the minor object, uh, you can see that it's, uh, it returns promise, uh, new. Uh, Ethereum account. So that, that'll be uh, what you will get if you query actually that field uh, miner. And you can see there's also context. I mean, then you probably have to, to um, dig into GraphQL if you want to know more about that, because uh, that's not the point today. Uh, but if you don't know GraphQL, you're probably wondering, OK, why are you telling us about that? I mean, it's just about data fetching, right? Well, not only. Uh, so GraphQL actually uh, will. Uh, opinionate your app, I think, in quite a heavy way. So first thing, you have the query and component collocation, uh, which might be different to how you abstract your network calls with Redux, right? With Redux, you will use the flux model. You'll put your network calls uh, somewhere here. It will really be collocated most of the time. Uh, also, you will reduce your Redux usage, pun intended. Uh, so you'll use Redux way less because of that. Because uh, most often, people will use Redux to um, make HTTP calls. Also, you have a complete ecosystem uh, with this, uh, which has, uh, for instance, can be optimistic UI updates, caching, uh, caching, batching with Apollo clients, uh, or URL, or even Relay. Um, it's really a complete ecosystem around GraphQL. By the way, it's also a new pattern to learn. It's not very complicated, but still a new pattern to learn. And if you use Relay, which is some opinionated uh, GraphQL client, uh, well, then you'll have also to learn uh, new concepts uh, on top of GraphQL. And for that reason, I think that GraphQL, it might seem like a small choice, but it will define your app architecture quite heavily. And by the way, another thing, another choice that you might be tempted to make, I mean, I was tempted to make it, was uh, styling, right? So at that point, uh, I also heard not only, oh, who, uses, uh, Graf uh, who doesn't use GraphQL, but also, who still uses CSS, right? So people told me, oh, you should use uh, CSS and JS. That's the new hot thing. So I've started using uh, CSS and JS. So I've seen there was uh, two major contenders, style components, emotion. But also, maybe um, you like SAS or less. In this, case, in this case, it's possible to import it in your code. Uh, you can do it like that. So that's made possible by Webpack Loader, meaning that, yes, you'll have to learn about Webpack if you want to be able to do that. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, we can import it um, as a default export. And then we'll have access to all the classes by doing uh, styles dot style name. Or you can call it whatever you want. Uh, but that's how it works with Webpack. 
There's also another option, uh, which is JSS. It was quite popular at the time, uh, not much anymore. Uh, it kind of looks like uh, React Native for the ones that have tried it. And it's basically a style object uh, with camel case, and you'll define your styles that way. So at that point, I thought I was really, really done with learning so many things, right? And with React 16.3, there was actually a context API uh, from within the library. And that was quite a game changer because many people, me included, uh, started taking lots of code out of Redux and just putting it into context. Uh, why? Because this is just an easy way to avoid props drilling, right? So uh, you have data that's accessible uh, from anywhere and you don't have to do props drilling, which is a major reason people use Redux, actually. So that was React 16.3. But by the way, there was also a new major release that I think uh, changed it for all of us here. And it's this one. Uh, has anyone here watched this talk, by the way? Can you raise your hand? Not that many. I really uh, recommend you to watch it. Uh, this is uh, Dana Abramov uh, explaining uh, why uh, they've built React hooks and what is going to change. And it's actually a nice deep dive into the React internals and uh, why class components were not optimal. And uh, so now we have this thing called hooks, which is a new way to interact with React. So you kind of have to relearn React in a certain way. Uh, because you still have the same internals, but you have different ways to interact with it. Uh, it's also very functional now, uh, which for many React developers was a great thing. They wanted to go more functional. Uh, it makes your components uh, easier to test because literally now all your components are actually a function. And because now all your components are a function, it's really easier to do composition out of the box from React. So hooks, I think, are pretty good. I mean, you'll go from something kind of like this, right? So you have a heading component. Uh, you have to instantiate it. You have your constructor uh, with props. You super it. Uh, you have your initial state with empty name. You have to do your bindings. OK, nowadays, you can uh, just use arrow functions. But let's say you know, you're still using uh, binds. Uh, then you have uh, your handle name change method, which will uh, set the name in state uh, with the event as parameter. And then you return. Uh, and you render with hi, uh, my name is this that state that name, and then some input with the value and the unchanged handler. As you can see, I mean, this is quite verbose to do something that easy. You have to do all this. Um, and also, I mean, this is an easy one, but as your components uh, grow larger, I mean, this, this gets really complex, right? And now with hooks, it looks like that, actually. So as you can see, uh, now, our state field uh, is literally just a hook with use state. We have uh, the default state, which is empty string, uh, as a parameter. And then we destructure it, and we have uh, the field and the setter uh, as two destructured fields. Uh, that's the syntax with it. And as you can see, I mean, our component uh, now is way smaller. Yo, my name is name. We don't have even this anymore because this is just, you know, simple function. Uh, even even our input, I mean, come on, like I use prettier, and now it works in one line, you know? Uh, so, I mean, that, that means everything to me. That's way easier. So hooks are amazing, right? Well, not really. Um, the thing with hooks in React is that they offer um, a lot of stuff, but there's also a few drawbacks if you take things from a, um, let's say, philosophical point of view. Um, so one, you have a new syntax to learn. It's not crazy, but it's a new syntax, and there is also a few drawbacks, so hooks order, many things. By the way, if you don't know how to destructure uh, arrays, many people in, in the React uh, community still don't know about it, by the way, because many people learn uh, JS with React. So also one new thing to learn. Uh, there's a new composition model to learn. Uh, for some people, that might be the first. Uh, for some people, that might be a new model. And also, it's a new reason to have debates in the community, because now uh, there is the or, uh, already existing models for composition, but people were like, oh, maybe hooks are better. Uh, also, there's existing model to build components, uh, which is class component, very popular. And, and now people probably like, oh, yeah, but it's better with hooks. Or you can do it simpler. So it makes a lot of debates, right, in the community. And 
I think it creates a lot of tensions. Uh, unfortunately, there's a side effect of such a new feature. You cannot avoid it, uh, but that's something to take into consideration. And the most important problem with this, in my opinion, is that now the entry barrier to React becomes even higher. Because if you learn about React, imagine you're a new React developer, and they tell you, OK, uh, you can uh, have class components, or you can have function components. By the way, they call SFC, uh, stateless function components. So you this developer, like, OK, so I have my component with uh, state, I have my component stateless, which is a function. And then you learn hooks, and you're like, oh, OK, so now I can have state in stateless components. I mean, it doesn't make sense, right? For us, it, it makes sense, because probably we know uh, React enough to know that uh, now stateless components, they're not stateless. But just try to imagine a newcomer, uh, either in React or either in your code base, you know, someone that haven't, hasn't uh, worked with React that much. It's, it's really complicated to grasp, you know, these um, levels of layers on top of each other to learn. And so, yeah, actually, I've initially chosen React because it was easy and I was really uh, lazy and I didn't want to learn much. But the thing is, like, my excitement was gone, right? Now I kind of look like something like this, you know? And I know I'm here to tell you that you should embrace uh, the React fatigue. And the first step to embrace the React fatigue, actually, is to understand that there's no solution against React fatigue. That's the sad news, but that's the thing. There's no solution. That's a side effect of having a micro library uh, with no batteries included. Uh, it will get better eventually you know, as things get more stabilized, because in the grand scheme of things, I mean, React is still quite new. But effectively, there is no solution. With that being said, uh, this can be mitigated. So this, there are ways to actually make it um, better. Uh, so the first thing, uh, which I see uh, many people do, and I've seen that in many code bases, is don't try to recreate a framework. So I've seen many people, uh, they say, oh, React, OK, that's cool. And they'll try to create a lot of abstractions, a lot of crazy complex architecture, which if you look into it, they're basically recreating a framework. Uh, the difference between them and, let's say, Next or Gatsby or whatever, uh, or even something full stack is that, well, they have to maintain them themselves. Uh, maybe it's not optimal. Uh, maybe there's maybe lots of bugs uh, that they're not aware about. I mean, that's never a good idea, in my opinion. Uh, also, don't be afraid to try non standard uh, libraries. Uh, when I say non standard, I mean maybe non um, conventional or non community approved. Uh, so I was, for instance, looking at uh, N26 uh, recently in the stack, and I've seen that they use. Uh, some totally random library for CSS and JS that I've never seen before. And actually, it seems to work perfectly fine for them, right? Uh, also, non-standard patterns that works uh, really well. Uh, same thing, I was looking uh, recently uh, at Revolut Tech, and there was this guy that had uh, this client-side architecture uh, for GraphQL. And it works really well for them. It's not community standard. It's not something that community will be like, wow, that's amazing. But it works. It works really well. Um, also, one more thing is to, uh, to ask yourself, OK, we have a new React developer in the team. Uh, would they learn easily, you know, one month from now? Do they grasp all the concepts, or is it still blurry for them? Um, how easy would, be, uh, would it be for them to actually jump on that? Also, one more thing, I think, is to avoid lock-in. That's quite important, uh, because that's probably the reason why you're using React in the first place. You don't want any kind of lock-in. So the first thing. Uh, so, about this new React developer learning. Mm. There is this thing uh, I would like to call the onion effect. And it's the fact that actually, uh, for something that for more experienced developers might seem easy to learn, there's actually a lot of underlying concepts, right? So, let's take Gatsby, for instance. Uh, who's there use Gatsby? Can you raise your hand? Right, so in Gatsby, actually, uh, I mean, for me, when I use it, I loved it. Uh, it abstracts so many things, and it makes it easier to work with the React. Uh, also, it, um, it avoids the whole setting up React, making your choices about this, about that. I love it. Um, but actually, you'll need to learn many concepts on top of React. Uh, first thing is GraphQL that you have to learn. Uh, you also have to learn also about nodes and edges. I mean, it's not that much, but it's still concepts that you need to learn. That's what I call the onion effect, right? It's this simple concept actually uh, has many underlying ones. 
also uh, try to avoid lock-ins. So try to understand how hard is it to opt out of your chosen solution. Uh, React, I think, has a very small footprint uh, because it's just a view library. But as you start to add new libraries on top of it, um, or even if you use frameworks, then you have bigger and bigger lock-ins. So as you go more towards a Rails-like solution with something like Meteor or Vulkan, for instance, you have a huge lock-in. Uh, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Do you, do you mind it? Then that's a question that you have to ask yourself. That's still a question, right? Uh, so that's something to take into consideration. Uh, also, I was discussing at some point uh, with my previous lead, uh, and the thing is that every pattern in uh, JavaScript or in React, or actually in programming in general, can be dirty. Meaning that you should really try to think that pattern uh, at scale in advance. So we've seen about uh, composition previously uh, with the compose function. Um, it gets really dirty really quick. Uh, believe me, when you have huge uh, component uh, composition pipelines, uh, then you have the flow right, uh, you'll have a flow left, you have branches in it. It gets really dirty. Uh, and it's not just with uh, composition, it's with every pattern. Uh, so a good thing to do is actually to regularly reconsider your choices because like when we have a huge app, you know, huge code base, uh, it's really easy to get distracted and just uh, work with it and forget the bigger picture. So try to regularly uh, imagine your new developer jumping into it how does it look for them? And try to, to really do that regularly. So that's, that's something that should be done uh, uh, regularly. And again, I mean, don't go full hipster, right? Uh, very high level concept, I know, but don't go full hipster. Seriously, stop trying to chase uh, every new library, every new concept out there, because that's what we are, JavaScript developers, kind of are hipsters, especially in React. Uh, what I mean by that is keep your app clean. So if you have um, some uh, pattern or technology, that's cool, use one library for it. You want to use CSS in JS, that's cool, then go all in, you know. You want to use uh, still CSS, I mean, that's perfectly fine, but again, go all in, you know. Don't, don't try to do some kind of Frankenstein mix of everything uh, just because you want to try it. Uh, if you want to make experiments, I mean, do it in isolated parts of your app. Uh, make it maybe, I don't know, in one component, in the header somewhere, but really try to keep it isolated. And if you don't like it, if it doesn't work for your app, just ditch it after it's done. Um, the goal is to actually have no conflicting patterns. That should be your goal at any point in time in your app. Uh, so let's say, if you look at your application, the React application today, uh, you should have no conflicting patterns. So maybe you're in the state, of course, of trying something, again, isolated, uh, but in the grand scheme of things, it should have no conflicting patterns at any point. And if you want to try everything, I mean, it's, it's cool to try all these new libraries out there. Uh, that's what pet projects are for, right? Um, it's, it's also more hipster points. So, you know, if you want to search for a new job, then uh, you do these side projects, you try everything there, and then you can have the keywords in your CV. It works perfectly well, and you receive lots of spams, emails, uh, potentially new jobs. So, I mean, yeah, side projects, very cool. And yeah, actually, uh, this talk is about embracing React. So why do I say you should embrace uh, the React fatigue? Uh, well, it's all about not forgetting why you choose React at first, right? So I told you I chose React uh, because I like my liberty. I chose React because it was easy, small to learn. Uh, same thing as Express, right? No batteries included. I can have fun. I can make my choices. And I really feel like I'm building something as opposed to Angular. Uh, for instance, or Rails, where, I mean, I'll, I'll still do work, but, you know, everything is abstracted for me. So that's the fun of it. That's why we chose React in the first place. Um, but with that being said, I mean, try to keep a skeptical mindset about things. Uh, never, never jump on the, on the bandwagon, you know, like everyone. Uh, and think of that React fatigue as a strength. So next time you'll be like, oh, new thing to learn. I have to learn that. Well, that's a strength, right? That's, that's why you're in React in the first place. Uh, maybe if you, if you don't like that, it might be time to actually choose a framework instead because you won't experience uh, such problems. And that's why I really think we should all embrace the ecosystem. Um, also, it's a very good idea uh, to always stay curious. And for that, actually, 
uh, you can use your free time uh, to read about new libraries, new patterns. Uh, so Twitter, Medium is really great for that. Uh, you don't even have to try them, right? You can just read about it and know what's happening in the ecosystem and know that alternative exists. Uh, even if you, if you don't try the trends, uh, knowing that they exist will really inspire you, I think. And it doesn't have even to be in React. You can have a look at what's um, in other communities. Uh, so for instance, I've seen that uh, in Elixir recently, uh, there was this thing called LiveView uh, that other languages are starting to, to uh, do as well, which is some sort of back-end control front-end. Uh, with WebSockets, you know, that's, that, that's totally different patterns, and that's things that really uh, make me curious and make me reconsider regularly my choices. Also, again, trends. Uh, it's very easy to get tracked by the community, but please keep your analytic mind. And if you don't want to go with it, uh, it's fine. I mean, I've worked in companies that uh, were not using Redux, were using custom solutions instead. And every time I'm discussing with other developers, they're like, what, you don't use Redux, you use Flux? It's fine, it's fine. You don't have to go with it. Uh, just make informed choices. You know, if it works for you, if it works at scale, that's perfect. And that's it. So I think with all of this, uh, you should be able to not be as tired with React Fatigue anymore, and uh, maybe even enjoy it. I mean, that's the point.